Hello and welcome back to Universe Sandbox 2. Today we're going to be doing something slightly different and just looking at changes we can do to our solar system that would make our solar system really awesome. So, the first thing we're going to do is simulate if the solar system, instead of having just the sun, had the sun in a binary orbit with a black hole. Or maybe not quite a binary orbit, just something that functions like one. This binary orbit would require it to move a bit. But if we do this... See, it pulls it away, which is the problem. We don't want that. We do not want that. We want both of them to stay relatively still. Um, so we're going to reattempt this. Uh, open, and then we just have to go to the solar system, and let's try again. If we get a black hole, actually, we can spoof this. If we put a black hole in, and we just position lock that and the sun, the sun doesn't move normally anyways, we can just pretend that they're orbiting each other nicely, um, because I can't actually get them to orbit each other nicely without flinging out- Okay! So there's the first problem with this. The sun is being ripped apart, which is causing a giant loss in gravitational pull. Actually, it looks like it's getting a gain because of the uh, presence of the black hole, but at the same time, the sun was just ripped really harshly apart, losing, uh, I think, a third of its mass, half of its mass. But because of the fact that there's two things now in the center of the solar system everything is getting pulled in closer because of there being about double the mass in there and let's see how this affects earth because the sun shrinking has seriously decreased the temperature of the planet but getting closer may stabilize it to the point where earth is not completely doomed one problem is lag and lots of it if we click off, we can try deleting all these little fragments. Because these are not important to the simulation. And they are just kind of laggy. Which makes it slightly smoother, but not quite what we need. But it appears that Earth is now just going to freeze. And enter a new ice age. So, I guess that answers what would happen in that case. Isn't that exciting? So, now that the world is pretty much frozen with North America, South, most of South America, or the edge, half of Africa frozen, all of Europe frozen, I think we can say, yeah, it is actually the end of the world. And as it goes into the negatives uh, worldwide, will the city lights shut off? Let's just test, let's put it to negative 100, or negative 200. No, the city lights will not shut off. Apparently, everyone's still alive. It's just slightly cold on Earth. Cold enough for you to instantly freeze. But that's fine. Nothing could possibly be wrong with that. And it looks like we're going to go on to the next thing we're going to do today. Which is, what if Earth had two moons instead of one? And that's... Uh, we're going to actually not do this in a solar system simulation. But the first thing we would notice in this is obviously the uh, lunar uh, tides would be... It really depends where the second moon was. We're going to put the second moon uh, on the exact opposite side of the first one. Or at least close to exact opposite. And we are going to make sure they're the same distance away. But depending on where it was, because right now, this basically means that the tides... So, because they're pulling on both sides of the Earth, and this moon is closest to this side, we'll still see some tides on both of these sides of the moon being slightly higher, even though they're pulling in opposite directions. The side they are on is closer to the ocean than the other side because of the size of the Earth itself. Um, if that made any sense to you, we'll talk about the second thing we'd see. Because the moons are pulling in both directions, the two sides of the Earth that are not being pulled on will have extremely low tides. Extremely low tides. Uh, 
And that would look very interesting in the world because many oceans would actually shrink a bit. Um, and it would change every day. You would be able to see the shrinkage just because of the two moons. But you have to realize that is double the mass. So we're going to go here, boom. Come on, boom. And now the orbits, oh no, because these aren't actually the same. Let's just go to motion. Uh, can we get distance? I think this is going to be fine, actually. I think I'm overanalyzing this. Okay, we'll turn trails and labels back on. So as the two moons orbit Earth, Earth is going to see, basically, like I said, uh, its tides be pulled in two directions, causing the other direction to the directions to have much less water. We're also going to see the two moons cause more lunar eclipses, obviously. Uh, this moon should technically be tilted, which would prevent lunar eclipses every day. But at the moment, how it is, we have it blocking out the sun at least once a day. So, other than that, the Earth seems to be pretty fine with this arrangement. But, what if these moons collide? So what we're going to do is we are going to slow down the motion on this moon. I don't know how this would happen realistically, but this isn't, we aren't being realistic here completely. So this moon has somehow encountered drag in outer space and now it's slowed down. This is going to cause the moon to go closer to the Earth and then fling around. And at some point, oh, did I time this perfectly? Oh, look how close those moons got together. And we may have to modify this to work a little bit better with what we're trying to do. Let's see if it happens to me. No. This is not a Kerbal Space Program, and I should not be attempting to play it as if it is. Although... That was kind of close right there. Oh, maybe they will hit. What are the chances? Never tell me the odds. Okay, these moons are very close together, so you know what? I'm just going to get it the rest of the way. Boom. Look at that. And then just up to the side. Up. And let's see what happens. Ooh, moons. You're going away from each other because of your residual motion. Okay, here we go. Here is the moons colliding into each other. And there's the explosion. How is this going to affect the world? Well, first off, at the moment, there's twice as much tidal pull on this side of the uh, Earth. Which is always uh, not a good thing, but at the same time, what does this look like from the surface of Earth? Let's be serious, this is going to be visible. So let's go on to Earth and find out. So if we drop down directly under it, we can look up into the sky and that is what we see in the sky. And it is very clear that something is not right there. You can see the orange ring from the collision. And if you had a telescope, you would be able to tell pretty clearly that something was not right. And as we get closer, now let's zoom in as if it's a telescope. So in a telescope, you'd see pretty much this from the Earth's surface. This right here. And that is pretty much doomsday because, well, so much on the Earth depends on the moon. And especially if something this big hit the moon, such as another moon, it would not be a good thing. <laughs> But now as the two moons merge, creating one even bigger, more massive moon, a few more questions are to be had. This moon, almost twice as massive as the moon before, is going to have a lot more pull. But not only that, but because of the excess mass, it's going to come in much closer to Earth. And it's going to have an orbit that is not circular anymore. Let's quickly look at it again from Earth to see if the orange moon looks cool. Which it certainly does. You can definitely see what's going on. And let's watch the havoc from above a little bit. 
Now, as I was saying, the moon is actually going to get much closer to the Earth during certain parts of its cycle now, which is going to be awesome to watch. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to put ourselves right above the Earth's surface. We're going to turn around and we're going to watch this. So we don't want to rotate with Earth, though. So here's Earth's surface. So we're now on Earth. Actually, where is this going to come in closest? So we're going to come in closest around here. So let's go to this part of Earth. And let's go down to the surface. And... Here we are. This is the closest we're going to get before clipping into Earth. Right about... Here? Maybe? Maybe not? Okay, yes. This this is good enough. Oh no, I've broken it. Okay, so we are now on Earth, and let's watch. So, if we speed up time, this is looking from Earth, we can see the moon getting bigger as it gets closer, which would be extremely scary to see. You can see all the particles coming off, there's Earth right there moving, and this is pretty much the ground view. So if you looked into the sky, you would see the orange part of the moon is spinning because the impact caused the moon to now spin at a different rate than the Earth's uh, rotation. So now it actually does not only have one visible side of the moon, we can see a few small explosions off of it. And look at this. Look how big the moon is getting. Look how close it's getting. It's now very visible. It's extremely visible. And that would take up a lot of your uh, vision, actually. And it would definitely be worrying to see. And then it goes further away again. And it goes back on its journey far away from the Earth again. So this would cause very interesting tidal patterns. As the moon gets closest to the Earth, it'll cause a giant, giant tides to occur. And when it's far away, it will basically does the opposite. There are no real tides at those times. Thankfully, the moon is not close enough to kick in the Rosh limit right now, but if it was, it would actually be ripping itself apart when it gets close like that. We can see its velocity gets pretty high, but let's cut some of the velocity at its highest point to show what could happen if it was a shot that hit the moon in the other direction, which would slow it down and make it get even closer to Earth. So if we go to velocity here and we turn it down, uh, pretty ironic is if we turn down velocity, it'll actually have a higher velocity in the end. So here we are. We have the moon. Where is the moon? Shoot, it's not as visible as it was before. Well, I guess it will be visible in a second. Where is the moon? Moon, where are you? I see Earth. Oh, there's the moon. So let's ride on the moon for a little bit, getting closer to Earth. And here we go. We are getting pretty close. And this is close enough that it will be very visible. Now let's take a little ride on Earth. We're going to start on this side of the world. So that we can watch over the period of a day as the moon gets closer. So that's the moon right there. And let's watch. So you can certainly see the spinning of the moon, and we are spinning too, which makes, which means that we won't be able to see the moon for a little bit during the uh, night, I guess. I don't really know if it's day or night. But we can see the moon definitely getting closer and larger in our vision. And where's the moon now? We're going to start seeing very interesting things happen soon. We're almost at that point. There we go. Look how close the moon is. And it's speeding up. 
exponentially getting faster, and we can see it getting closer and closer. It's now bigger than it looked last time. It is now huge, taking up a large portion of the horizon. And now we're going to start seeing Rosh limits kick in because of its proximity to Earth. So now watching the sky any second now. Flinging by, is it not close enough? It should be close enough to kick in some rush uh, effects, but it may not. What is the temperature on the moon at the moment? 18 degrees, it's not close enough. Interesting, I would have thought by now it would have taken a little bit of a hit. There are serious gravitational forces here, and when tidal forces get too intense, it will actually rip the body apart and cause a ton of heating to occur, but it appears that the moon has made it without that fate, which means that we're going to have one last passerby by the moon. So let's go up to the top of its orbit, its apoapsis, and let's kill its velocity once again. There we go. That's going to get so close to the Earth it may actually hit it. But, you know what? <laughs> this is science. And here comes the moon, ever so slowly speeding up, getting closer to Earth. You can see that's already going pretty fast, but let's just go back to where it's pretty darn close to Earth. Let's go back on Earth and watch the fireworks. So looking up into the sky, there is the moon. And speeding up, here is the moon getting closer to Earth. Getting closer to Earth as we spin along with it. And look at that. This is actually what the sky looks like at this distance. Now Earth's shadow actually covering the moon as it comes by in the closest. Uh... <laughs> closest pass that we could possibly do without someone getting hurt and by someone I mean earth and it appears that it's actually not going to hit I'm being much too conservative about my uh, aim here I need to be a little bit more crazy and let's go the last time this is definitely going to get the Rosh limit involved, and if not only that, it will hit Earth. Um, and this will be the end of this episode. So, now any second, any second now, here we go, very close to Earth. This is it, let's go on a part of Earth that still has a little bit of sunlight left. And there's the moon, and here it comes down. The moon actually appears to have a little bit of water or something on it. Something's reflecting on it. Interesting. Maybe it did take something from the Earth's atmosphere last time it passed by. And here comes the moon down. Now, if this one to be, this is a Majora's Mask moment right now. But because of the curvature of the Earth, it actually isn't that close yet. We just have to go on to the other part of the Earth so that we can look up and see this. Now that is a scary image. And the moon is getting even closer still. Taking up pretty much the entire visible sky. And here's the Rosh limit kicking in. The gravity of the Earth is now powerful enough on the moon to rip it apart. And they are very close together now, the moon and Earth. Um, yeah, very visibly close. And the moon is getting ripped apart before going back on its way, but it leaves a ton of damage on itself in a ring around Earth, which then falls and hits the earth, damaging it greatly. <laughs> Look at that. Look at the craters. Ignore the freezing because there's no uh, sun here to warm up earth 
we can just set it to 50 degrees and let it slowly cool down again. But look, part of Africa is gone. And let's do our last flyby because even that wasn't enough to destroy it. And here it goes. We're going to cut the velocity to almost zero. And that is definitely going to do what we need. There we go. That's enough. It's pretty much falling directly into Earth now with what seems to be a moon for the moon. Because the moon has a little bit of, uh, bit of debris going around it now. And yeah, the moon's just crashing straight down onto Earth. And for the last time, let's get an Earth view of this. There's the moon. And let's go. And the moon is back above us again. And as the planet spins, where's the moon now? Where is it? I've lost the moon. Uh-oh. I'm really trying to be careful here not to miss. Oh, there we go. There's the moon, and look at how quickly it's coming at us now. Blocking out pretty much the entire sky. Here it is, breaking through the atmosphere. This is the ground, and here we are, the moon, which actually has the mass of two moons, collides with Earth, sending out a shockwave like nothing you could imagine. And you can see all the damage, the rock being thrown out. We're actually, we were just crushed by the impact. Uh, we're actually now, yeah, you can see the moon pretty well from here. And boom, all the debris flies out in every direction, falling back onto Earth. Some is ejected out into space permanently. And Earth now looks like this. Well, guys, thank you for watching. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And no, I did not say leak a like this time, so I'm proud of that. And I will see you all next time. Peace out.